maintain a positive relationship with them to uh, allow us to place locks on their gates or no locks at all. Um, we assist with replacing gates with cattle guards to kind of alleviate any issues of gates being left open. Um, it helps with kind of our response time as well. <clears throat> and you talked about you know maintaining that good relationship. Is part of that helping them um, when there are issues with having to cut fences for access and things like that? Yes, yeah, so the branch ladies, I'm actually all where they will um, assist with actually mending the fences that are cut. So if, it, if sometimes our horse patrol or ATVs will have to cut a fence to uh, respond in the traffic. There's, there's no way to actually get to that traffic. There's not a gate close by um, to, to get actually get on the other side of the fence with the horses or the ATV. They may have to cut it. So they'll reach out to me to actually fix it, or they'll fix it themselves, or we'll notify the ranchers that we had had make a cut in the fence. So is the idea then kind of to keep good PR with those folks so yes, that you have a good relationship with them? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you talked a little bit about the communication that you have with the ranchers. Um, what's the purpose of communicating with them? How do you communicate with them? So the main purpose is, uh, is, is safety. Um, we're constantly patrolling on these properties that they, they work, they ranch. Um, so the main concern is, is, is safety. Um, I actually use the government issued phone that's assigned to the, to the ranch liaison unit. Um, so I have a government issued phone that's assigned to me, um, and that's how we kind of communicate, is through text messages or, or phone calls. Um, just so that, to make them aware if we are working in the area, um, that way they can, there's no interference, there's no safety concerns, no surprises. If they know we're working in the area, they may stay out of the area for, for a little bit that way, especially since we use air support a lot, uh, helicopters that fly overhead. If someone would be on horse, horseback working, you know, cattle, um, we don't want to spook their horses with the, the, uh, the helicopter. So just a, a friendly text or a phone call saying, hey, the war patrol is going to be in the area working a group, say, um, they might just stay out of the area. Maybe if they're working near that area, we will just come back another time when we have cleared and we're finished with our operations. Okay. So. <laughs> Generally, the idea then is just to keep folks away from your operations. Is that what the communication is for? Yes, ma'am. And then you kind of sometimes get that information flows the other direction as well, right? Yes, ma'am. They'll, uh, they'll call us as well saying, you know, if they feel comfortable notifying us, um, they'll let us know if they see any traffic, you know, immigration related or narcotics related. Um, they'll give us a heads up on that as well. <coughs> okay. <clears throat> Now, in January of 2023, in your professional capacity, did you know a property owner named George Allen Kelly? Yes, ma'am. And do you know where his ranch was located? Yes, ma'am. Uh, where was it located? On the east side of Nogales, Arizona, near Kino Springs. Is that in Santa Cruz County? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> you talked about Nogales Border Patrol's area that you all are responsible for. Yes, ma'am. What area is that? So we go from downtown Nogales area, um, Arizona, we go as far east as Mount Washington, which would be similar. If you look to the east of downtown Nogales, if you see that big mountain out there, that's Mount Washington. That's kind of our scene. The top of that mountain is kind of our scene to the far east. We go as far west as Aravaca, if you're familiar with that. And then we go as far north as, pretty far as Green Valley, Arizona. So Mr. Kelly's property is within the Nogales Station, Border Patrol Station area, is that Yes, right? ma'am. And was he someone you knew in your capacity as a ranch liaison? Yes, ma'am. Could you tell us um, what name did Mr. Kelly ask you to call him? Um, Alan, I believe. I called him Mr. Kelly. I don't okay. Refer to him. But he, he would refer to himself as Alan sometimes? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And did you ever meet Mr. Kelly in person? I did, yes ma'am. And could you tell the jury a little bit about when you first met Mr. Kelly? So when I first met Mr. Kelly, I, I don't remember what time of year it was. He was out of town when I took over the ranch liaison and driving around with the, uh, the former ranch liaison, he was unavailable. So I had reached out to him probably several weeks after that. We met at his property. Um, he just kind of gave me a, a tour of the, the property there, kind of pointed out some, some areas. <clears throat> and did you have some communication with him by phone? We did, yes ma'am. Did you have him in your phone as a contact? Someone, I did, yes ma'am. Someone you regularly reached out to? Yes ma'am. And was that, 
for things like you just described to let them know about operational things that were happening and things of that nature? Yes, ma'am. Now I want to move forward to the events of January 30th of 2023. Could you tell the jury what were you doing that day um, when the events began involving this case? So when the events actually began at 2.30 p.m., I was actually changing out. I was at my locker uh, changing out, getting ready to, to go home when I received a phone call. And you received a phone call at what time? 2.30 p.m. And what, do you recall what number you received that from? It was a, a number that, I w that was not saved in my contacts. It was 520-604, and I don't remember the last four, but it was a number not saved in my contacts. Did you document that in your report? I did, yes, ma'am. Okay, we'll come back to that in a few minutes <clears throat> for the phone number. But um, when you got that call at 2.30, you said well, you were- Can we go back real quick? Sure. I don't think I documented the actual telephonic number, the actual number in my report. Okay. Um, it was on your phone log, is that right? Yes, ma'am. And when you got the call at 2.30, um, you said you were changing out. Tell us what you were doing. I was at my locker changing into gym clothes to, to work out. Okay. And when you when you got that call, who was the call from? Uh, Mr. Alan Kelly. And could you tell the jury about the call? So upon answering the phone, I, uh, it was Mr. Kelly right away. Um, he seemed very rushed and a little frantic at the, at the call. Um, he said, Jeremy, I, I'm being shot at. I'm shooting back. I said, Mr. Kelly, are you okay? And he stated that he was un unable to talk at that time. So I told Mr. Kelly I would call the station, send agents out there. <clears throat> and did he tell you anything about anything else about what he was observing at that moment? At that time, he observed five subjects running southbound. And did he say what they were running with? Packs. <clears throat> and what was his tone like? It was, it was pretty fr uh, rushed. It sounded like he was exerting himself, kind of frantic. Did you, um, and you said you knew it was Mr. Kelly. How did you know it was Mr. Kelly? Just by his, his accent, um, his, his, his tone, um, his very distinct voice, um, the way he says my name, the way kind of he talks. So you recognize his I voice? I recognize his voice, yes ma'am. <clears throat> let me just show you, um, you need to let me know if I got this accurate. Does that look accurate on what you just told me, the statements were that Mr. Kelly gave, gave you that day? Yes, ma'am. You're under permission to display. I'm just, it's as if I'm writing on the whiteboard. Right. Permission granted. So this is what we call a demonstrative exhibit. Um, the other exhibits that are presented and admitted in evidence are in evidence. And any exhibit that's admitted in evidence, you'll have available to you in the jury room. This is not something that's admitted into evidence. It's demonstrative. It's just a guide to that someone, a lawyer can use to just help you understand the evidence better. But as I said, any exhibit that's been admitted into evidence, um, <coughs> and there have been some so far, will be available to you in the jury room when you go back to deliver. So yes, um, we already have that. <coughs> Agent Morso, um, after you got this call from Mr. Kelly, what did you do? 
I immediately called the uh, Nogales Border Patrol Station to report it. You were already in the Nogales Border Patrol Station? I was. We have uh, such a large facility. Um, <coughs> and um, be uh, frank, uh, honest, I was in my underwear was when he called. Um, and it's just more feasible to just make a phone call to uh, to the radio room. We have such a large facility. I mean, time if, uh, if I hear somebody's being shot at, I want to get agents out there as soon as possible. So I just transferred the call to the Dallas Border Patrol Station, even though it was you know, in the facility. And when you said transferred the call, you mean you called? You didn't I, I transfer called. Mr. Kelly, right? No, no, ma'am. I called. Okay. So when you called and you reported it, uh, what did you ask them to do? To uh, send agents to Vermillion Mountain Ranch. Uh, Mr. Kelly reported that he was being shot at. And did you have some conversation with someone in dispatch and make sure that was happening? I did. I talked to a Border Patrol agent, Joshua Tercy, who I spoke with. And did you ask them to do anything else in terms of, did you just ask them to send out Border Patrol or did you ask for something else as well? I asked for Border Patrol as well as the Sheriff's Department. So just that sometimes we're not available, get Sheriff's there as well. <clears throat> And after you made that call to the station um, and you knew that was all underway, what did you do next? After I spoke with the, uh, the station, I called Mr. Kelly back to check on his welfare. And what time, what time was that call? That was at 2.36 p.m. And when you called him back, what was his demeanor like during that call? This time he was a little calmer. He didn't seem as rushed. Um, still kind of adrenaline filled I, I would say um, but he was a little more calmer this time he was able to speak <clears throat> and what did he tell you was happening at this time or what did he tell you during this phone call so this time he, he stated that he had saw five subjects um, walking northbound with packs towards Keno Springs um, and I proceeded to ask Mr. Kelly if he was being shot at and uh, at this time he said he had heard a gunshot and saw his horse walking by or running by frantically um, and at the time it kind of sounded like he was inspecting the horse and I believe he even stated that his horse doesn't appear to be shot. Um, I asked Mr. Kelly if he had seen any firearms on the subjects that he saw running so I could notify the station and give the agents responding an update. Um, at this time he stated that it was too far to tell if they had firearms. <clears throat> Does that accurately summarize the 236 call? Yes, ma'am. So I just want to make sure I get this right. The first call at 2.30, he says they're running southbound. Yes, ma'am. Is that right? And then the second call, he says they're running toward Keno Springs. He said they were running towards Keno Springs, and he also said that he wasn't sure if they were, I can't remember if he said doubling back or circling around to, to head back southbound. Okay. So, but Keno Springs is to the north of his property. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. And so he indicated they were... He thought they were doubling back to head southbound again? Yes, ma'am. But you're not sure about that, is that what you said? Exactly. Oh, you're yes, not sure of the exact words? Yes, ma'am. It was either doubling back or circling back, one or the other? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So after this phone call, what did you do next? So this time I called the, the station back again to uh, update them, let them know that at this time I was able to speak with them, he's okay. And uh, that he didn't see any firearms at the time. So, other than him saying that he heard a gunshot and his initial statement that he was being shot at, that he retracted in the second call, did he ever say he saw any firearms in these two phone calls? No, ma'am. Did he ever say he saw anyone point a gun at him? No, ma'am. And then during the second phone call, if I understand it correctly, understood you correctly, he initially said he'd been shot at, but the second time he said, no, he just heard a gunshot. Yes, ma'am. And after you touch base with your, with your um, supervisors, anything else happened following this call? Upon reporting everything to my supervisor in person, then we reported it to his command staff as well. Okay. 
Um, other than that internal reporting that happens within the department, anything happen um, substantively with Mr. Kelly? No, ma'am. As far as you know, were agents deployed out to the scene? Yes, ma'am. Actually, uh, on the second phone call, BPA Tercy actually relayed to me that two, at least two agents were responding, as well as the sheriff's department. Okay, so when you spoke to them during the second call or after the second call? During the second call. So during the second call with Mr. Kelly, that's when Tercy told you there were agents responding? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Were you aware of what happened at that time, or did you? Is that the end of your part? That was the end of my part in the, that situation. What did you do after that? So after relaying everything to my command staff and my supervisor's command staff, then I proceeded to to return home. So you went off duty. Yes, ma'am. Yep. And do you keep your ranch liaison with you, ranch liaison phone with you even when you're off duty? Yes, ma'am. And did you do that on this occasion? I did, yes. That is that the phone that Mr. Kelly was calling you on, just to be clear? Yes, ma'am. Do you recall the phone number for that phone? I, I believe I do have it wrote down, I don't know if, I can, but I think it's 520, Four seven zero nine three six five. I believe it's been so long since I've had that position or used that phone. I believe that's it. Okay. So tell us what happened next with respect to this case. So at approximately four twenty-three, I'm uh, at the gym in uh, Green Valley, and that's when I receive another phone call from Mr. Alan Kelly. This time it's from a number that's under my contact saved is um, Alan Kelly. So the first call that you had was not a number that you had under your contacts but you recognized his voice and then when you called him back did you call him on the number you have or the number he called you from? If you recall. I, I don't recall. Okay so the third call for sure that calls coming from the normal number you have in your contacts for him. Yes ma'am. Okay. And tell me about that call. What did Mr. Kelly tell you? This phone call, he was calling out, um, and he immediately thanked us for our responsiveness, the agents responding, the sheriffs responding as well. He was just kind of expressing his gratitude for the quick response to his property after the incident. What was his demeanor like on this call? It was the, the normal um, Mr. Kelly that I've always dealt with. He was, he was pretty calm. And when, when he, you started, did you start? Did he start to talk to you some more about what happened that day? He did. Um, typically, when there is a situation, no matter you know how minor it is, if it's a cut in the fence or, or something like this, I always try to meet with the ranchers or the property owner um, the next day or when feasible. I'm just gonna talk everything over in, in person, or if there's something I need to fix, you know, I'll be there in person to do it. Um, so we had talked about meeting up the following day to uh, discuss the situation. Um, and then he immediately went into discussing the, uh, the incident. And when he started talking about the incident, what was his demeanor like at that time? He got a little, little more amped up, um, a little more uh, kind of adrenaline filled, a little more excited, I guess. Did you previously describe him as super excited and sort of rambling on? Yes, ma'am. And would that be accurate? Yes, ma'am. And what did he tell you about what had happened earlier during this conversation? So at this time he stated that uh, him and his wife were sitting inside their home and uh, they heard what sounded like a gunshot. Um, he went to his back porch and he saw his horse frantically running by. Um, this is when he observed at least 10 subjects um, walking with packs and they all had, he stated, AR style rifles. Um, he stated that his wife had seen it too as well at least 10 subjects walking towards Kino um, with AR style rifles and packs. And did he say anything about um, what he was describing these individuals as? He described them as uh, drug mules. And then at some point did he give you a different number than 10 subjects during this call? Stick that again. 
did he did he give you an even larger number after he originally told you 10 subjects? He said approximately 10 to 15. 10 to 15. And he said they were all carrying AR style rifle, rifles? Yes, ma'am. And what's Mr. Kelly's wife's name? Wanda. Could you take a look at that and see if I've accurately summarized your statements there? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so I want to walk through this with you. So on this occasion, um, he didn't say he's getting shot at and he's shooting back. He says he's inside the house when he hears a gunshot. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. And he also says that it was at that point that he goes outside and sees the horse running by. Yes, ma'am. And the first time you talked to him, he said five subjects. But the next time you talked to him, he said 10 subjects and then 10 to 15, all loaded down with AR-style rifles. Yes, ma'am. Is this the first time that he told you that he saw rifles? Yes, ma'am. The voice that you heard on this phone call, was it the same voice you heard on the 230 and the 236 phone calls? They're, they're pretty similar, yes, ma'am. So, I guess my question is, I know there, that the demeanor has changed, but was it the same person on all three phone calls? Yes, ma'am. And you recognize the voice? Yes, ma'am. So, after this phone call, what's the next thing that you did? I proceeded to, to go in the gym and complete my workout. So, you went from this phone call, your, where were you when you took this phone call? In the parking lot of the, the gym. And you were off duty, is that right? Yes, ma'am. And so then you headed on in the gym, and then what's the next thing that happened related to this case? At approximately 5.20-something, I think it was 5.35 when I noticed that I was completing my workout, I was putting the gym equipment away, I thought I heard my, my, my phone alert, um, so I went over to my phone to check it out, and I saw a missed call from uh, Mr. Kelly, as well as a text message from Mr. Kelly. Text message stated, um, call me immediately. Um, and there was also a voicemail from Mr. Kelly as well. So you missed a call and you missed a text message, is that right? Yes, ma'am. And does 523 sound like the correct time for the missed call? Yes, ma'am. And does 526 sound like the correct time for the missed text message? Yes, ma'am. two exhibits in front of you now. Could you first take a look at Exhibit 60.1, State's Exhibit 60.1? Do you recognize that? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And what does that appear to be? A uh, screenshot of a phone log. And is that the um, text message you just discussed a minute ago? Yes, ma'am. And then um, Exhibit 59, do you recognize that? And I said 523, but that was a 526 text message, correct? Yes, ma'am. Right. And then, um, could you take a look at item 59? Do you recognize them? Yes, ma'am. And how do you recognize it? I actually listened to it and signed the, uh, the thumb drive for the voicemail of Mr. Kelly that I left on my government issue phone. And does that appear to be what you signed and listened to? Yes, ma'am. 
And Your Honor, with the court's permission, I'll proceed to play the voicemail, which we're moving. I've moved in, pardon me, Your Honor, I've moved for admission of State's Exhibit 59 and State's Exhibit 60.1. I have no objections, Your Honor. 59 and 60.1 are admitted. And may I publish? Yes. Voicemail. Lynn, this is Alan Kelly. You need to call me immediately. This is serious. Call me immediately. I can't say more over the phone. Bye. And does that accurately um, depict the voicemail message you received? Yes, ma'am. And I'm showing on the screen now State's Exhibit 60.1. Is that an accurate representation of the text message that you received? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> and just to verify, since I got it right, got it wrong the first time, that's January 30th, 2023 at 5.26 p.m. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. And you said it was about 5.35 that you noticed you'd missed the text message in the phone call. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. And what did you do when you noticed that? I immediately called Mr. Kelly back. Did y'all play some phone tag? We did. He didn't answer the first, first time. I proceeded to call him back again, and I believe he was calling into me, and I answered his phone call. Tell me, when you got this call from Mr. Kelly, what was his tone like? So now it had changed to a Mr. Kelly that I've never heard before, but now he sounded scared. <clears throat> And what did Mr. Kelly tell you when you spoke to him? So upon greeting Mr. Kelly, he uh, pretty much right off the bat stated that uh, it's, it's this was worse than he could ever imagine. And did he say anything else? He said he needed uh, agents to respond to his property, someone to, to meet with him. He, he asked where I was, and I, I told him I was off duty, that I wasn't able to respond, um, nor is it how the, the Border Patrol works but, um, when you're off duty. But, so I proceeded to tell him, he sounds like he needs to be checked on, and um, that could send agents out there. And when he said it's worse than he could imagine, did he repeat that a couple of times, and then did he say some other phrases as well? He did. He had stated it again that it's, it's worse than he could ever imagine. And did he say, this is bad, this is bad, as well? He did, yes, ma'am. And did you ask him for some details about what was going on? I did, because um, I have to report to my station to get agents out there, so I want to give them the most accurate information that I can. Um, it, it sounded that something had happened, so I wanted to relate to the agents or whoever was going to respond out there the most accurate information on what to expect when they get on scene. Um, so I proceeded to ask him what was going on, if you could clarify, if you could be specific on what was worse than he could imagine. And how did he respond to you? He responded that he couldn't state it over the phone. Um, he proceeded to ask if any agents responded out there, if anything, they would have to report anything. Um, I was very clear with him that ever since he called me at 2.30 p.m., I reported that. Every phone call after that was reported to the station as well as my command staff um, that everything's been reported and will continue to be reported. Did you find this unusual that he was asking you these questions? I did, yes ma'am. And what was his tone like when you were having this part of the conversation? Now his tone was kind of more cautious of what he would say, um, somewhat evasive. Did that cause you concern? It did, yes ma'am. Did you continue to press him for details? I did for, you know, a few more seconds uh, until I kind of just ran out of patience of, of trying to get out of so I could report accurately. Um, finally, he stated that something was possibly struck earlier. And do you recall specifically what he told you? So pro after he had told me that something was possibly struck, again, I tried to clarify what was actually struck. So we played this game, this guessing game, going back and forth. And I, at one point I stated, was it an animal? He stated, well, you could possibly, you know, classify it as an animal. And 
was the specific phrase, you know how shots were fired earlier, something was possibly struck? Is that what he said to you? Yes, ma'am. And so after you continued to try to get more information out of him, um, you said he told you he couldn't tell you more over the phone. What did you suggest to him at that point? So at this time I suggested that he call the sheriff's department, report that what he encountered on his property, and I told him I would call the station and have agents respond as well. And how did he respond to you when you told him that? He kind of just stated, okay. Um, did he talk to you about who he wanted to come out to his residence that day? He did. He did specify that he preferred, when I said about the sheriff's department, he did state that he preferred that the uh, Border Patrol respond. because He said it was a Border Patrol or a border related issue is what he had said. And did he specifically say you need to get Border Patrol? Yes, ma'am. And this is a border related issue? Yes, ma'am. So he didn't, he clearly didn't want the sheriff's department to respond, is that right? You stated it. Actually it actually calls for speculation. Did you, um, after your conversation with him, is that the end of your conversation with him? Yes, ma'am. And during this conversation, you indicated his demeanor was scared. Um, would you also describe that as nervous? Is yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Could you take a look and see if I have, oh, sorry, I this one there. Um, see if I've accurately related the, summarized your statements just now. Yes, ma'am. Showing you States Exhibit 53. Um, is your report contained in there? <coughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. And did you document the the phone numbers that you receive the calls from in that report? I did not. You also had an interview with Detective Ainsa and Detective um, Barba, is that right? Yes, ma'am. Do you remember relaying that information to them during that phone call? Are you doing that interview? I do, yes, ma'am. I don't see it documented in that interview, do you? No, ma'am. Okay. You did, that is the text message you received, though, correct? Yes, ma'am. And those are the phone calls that were accurately relayed today, correct? Yes, ma'am. And they would be, the numbers would be 
the first two calls came from one number and the remaining calls came from the regular number you had with Mr. Kelly as a contact, correct? Yes, sir. Thank you. That's all I have for this witness, Your Honor. Thank you. Oh, excuse me, I do have one more. I do have one more question for you. Um, when you, during the times that you've spoken with Mr. Kelly, did he regularly ha carry a handgun? Yes, ma'am. And what type of handgun, if you know, and where did he carry it? I don't recall the type of firearm, but he always wore it in a holster on his right hip. <clears throat> Did you have some discussions with Mr. Kelly about carrying an AK-47? One of the times I believe is the first time we met, maybe he had discussed that he does routinely patrol his property with a, an AK-47. And that's all I have, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy Lowell Corp attorney. I have not. You never met me before this? No. Other than seeing me maybe in the hallway? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, so to be clear, you work in a unit separate from the Sheriff's Department, correct? Yes, ma'am. Just curious, when you're within the boundaries of your jurisdiction where you explain how far you go in different directions, right? Yes, ma'am. What if there's an incident that involves, um, you know, a crime? Who has that final jurisdiction? Is it you or the Sheriff's Department? How does that work? So it depends what crime it is. If it's immigration related, typically we'll take over that part. But if it's like a, a, a crime outside of that, the Sheriff's Department will take over. We don't, we, we enforce, you know, not the same laws as the Sheriff's Department or local. Police Department and force. You do have some separate laws that do fall in your jurisdiction, like drugs. Sure, yes, ma'am. Smuggling. Yes, ma'am. Um, name some of the others that you can think of. Um, so narcotics, uh, smuggling, um, illegal entry without inspection. Is that a crime? It is illegal yes, entry without inspection. Yes, ma'am. And what's an inspection? Uh, crossing the international boundary other than a designated port of entry. And with the right to inspect if they do, when they come over that port of entry? Yes, ma'am. So when they avoid the port of entry, they're not giving you a chance to inspect? Right. So therefore that becomes the crime? That becomes crime, yes, ma'am. I get you, just trying to follow. Me. Yes, ma'am. Um, are these federal or state laws? These are federal law. Okay. So if you get a drug trafficker, would that be a violation under federal law? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so you are considered law enforcement. Yes, ma'am. And I noticed you seem to be in uniform, correct? Yes, ma'am. And you do carry weapons. I do, yes, ma'am. And both um, things that might, like guns, but also less lethal weapons, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Because you don't know what you're going to face in an encounter. Is that right? Exactly. Now. There's, there's types of smuggling going on out there, isn't there? Yes, ma'am. What are the different types? There's human smuggling and also narcotics smuggling. Okay, and both of them potentially are a crime? Yes, ma'am. Federally also? Yes, ma'am. And we're all aware of a very, very uh, scary drug out there called fentanyl. Are you aware Objection of that? Objection relevance, Your Honor. There's no indication there's any fentanyl involved in this case. Uh, Your Honor, this is going to not only his job test, which they opened the door, but to the things that he would be out there doing as a liaison and communicating to the ranchers that are along the border, <coughs> things to be prepared. It goes to the state of mind of my client. Texas overruled. Thank you. So you're aware of fentanyl being a very scary drug out there right now, right? Yes, ma'am. And is smuggling, whether it's fentanyl or other drugs, 
do they usually always come through point of entry or are they avoiding those areas and coming around? Your Honor, objection, relevance, and also um, Rule 701. She's asking for opinions of a witness that's a lay witness. And I'd like to make an, ar I'd like to make an argument on that. Your Honor, he is an expert as far as expertise knowledge as far as him being Border Patrol. This is what he does for a living. This is the things that he advised my clients to be careful of and the state of mind that eventually goes to my client. And so he is the perfect witness for this. This is what he does every day. And Your Honor, this witness was not listed as an expert witness. And Rule 701 indicates that the witness's testimony has to be rationally based on the witness's perception. It has to be helpful to clearly understanding the witness's testimony or determining a fact and issue and not based on scientific and not based on scientific or otherwise or, or other specialized knowledge. This witness did not perceive anything on this occasion that has anything to do with what um, Ms. Bothorp is asking this witness about. Objections overruled. You can answer the question. All right. We can proceed, okay? Um, let me, the smuggling that's coming through, um, are they coming outside of where the checkpoints are, or are they also coming outside of that area? Both. Okay. And you're patrolling outside at this time period and acting as a liaison for information um, outside of the checkpoints, correct? Yes, ma'am. These ranchers don't live on the checkpoint, correct? No, ma'am. So I'm visualizing a checkpoint, a station where you go through and it allows uh, the federal government to inspect or talk to any subjects going through check papers uh, and their rights to be there. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. When you avoid that, you are uh, potentially, like you said, breaking the law and not uh, showing proper credentials, um, not allowing a ch uh, an inspection and things like that, correct? Yes, ma'am. Now, you're familiar with the area near my client's ranch, correct? Yes, ma'am. Do you have an approximate idea how large of a ranch he has? I believe it's approximately between 170 and 180 acres. Okay. And although that sounds really large, it's not necessarily one of the bigger ranches out in his area. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, and are you aware that he uh, does uh, cattle, um, maybe not only his own over the years, but also takes on cattle from other ranchers? Yes, ma'am. And you've seen that? Yes, ma'am. And you're aware that he has a horse? Yes, ma'am. And, and he, uh, over the time, you also know he has uh, dogs, correct? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Now, it's important that a rancher has barbed wire or some kind of fencing to keep their livestock in and keep other people's livestock from entering their own property, correct? Yes, ma'am. And that's why you said if you had an emergency that where you guys had to, as Border Patrol, had to cut through to get to a situation, you also tried to repair that in respect of the homeowner's property, correct? Yes, ma'am. So when someone not only comes through the property, if they're illegal, they're breaking a crime, correct? Yes, ma'am. When they come on a property, they're breaking a crime by tr trespass, correct? Yes, ma'am. And if they're shooting on their property, that's aggravated assault, and that's a crime also. Isn't that correct? Objection, Your Honor. Calls for a legal conclusion. Sustained. I don't know if he knows the definition of it. Do you know what an aggravated assault is? I mean, not verbatim. I don't enforce the aggravated assault. Okay. But is a person allowed to shoot at someone else? No, ma'am. Okay. And would you suspect that it's a crime? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so these three factors are being told to you that day that there is a crime afoot on his property back on January 30th of last year, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, the things in there, just for educational, some of the things that you are aware of, again, that you may have also shared with my client. You do educate my client and other ranchers about things going on, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And would you, would it be fair to say there's been increases of activity out on the ranchers' properties that 
over years have increased. Have, have you had a chance to observe that? An increase in traffic? Yes. Yes, and, and both, and also the de decrease in traffic as well over the years. It kind of fluctuates. Okay, and leading up into this, you made numerous text messaging and communications to my client to be careful of different activities that was going around near his property. Isn't that true? Yes, ma'am. And there's a bunch of text messages to prove that, isn't there? Yes, ma'am. And you wanted him to be safe with his wife, right? Yes, ma'am. Is that all? Is that the only two people living on this property of this ranch, the Vermilion Ranch, that you're aware of? They're the only two I'm aware of. And it's fair to say they are senior citizens, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so they would be a little more vulnerable to things that might be going on that might be crime-like, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and so you probably had some concerns for their safety, I would imagine? Yes, ma'am. You actually were in you know, really good communication with him and overseeing and looking out for him, weren't you? Yes, ma'am. And as it should be, right? And that's that's the job? point of the detail, yes, ma'am. Okay. But you earnestly did it with care and concern. Yes, ma'am. All right. And then when you have smugglers, you already told us that there's different kinds of smugglers, human trafficking, drug trafficking, correct? Yes, ma'am, as well as firearms as well. Firearms are important. Mm -hmm. Firearms always carry some form of value, don't they? Yes, ma'am. I mean, that's common knowledge, right? Mm-hmm. And that's a yes for the court reporter, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and I'm not trying to, you know, but she she needs those words. No, I call myself. That's fine. Um, yeah, and can I just show a continuing objection for the record? So noted. Thank you. And I would imagine in your position, all those things that you talked about, the smugglers, you know, guns, uh, human smuggling, drug, smuggling, trafficking, those are things you have encountered and have some experience with yourself, correct? Make yes, ma'am. Yes, ma made arrests, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I mean, that's part of your job, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And although you're new, it didn't take long before you got acquainted with those types of things going on around you, I would assume. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And when you were doing a ride-along, I would assume, we, oh, were you riding along when you were on probation or were you out on your own? Field training unit, we were actually riding with a senior agent upon completing the field training unit, then I did ride solo sometimes with a, a journeyman as well. So in the beginning, I would assume you had to ride along first, and then eventually they kind of cut you loose. I'm still on probation, but now that you've been trained a little better, you were now cut loose to ride your own vehicles? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And the terrain out there is flat, and there's also mountains, right? Yes, ma'am. And there's a lot of uh, ravines or arroyos or washes? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And it, it just covers the whole terrain, doesn't it? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you're aware that there are cameras out there, right? So, yes, ma'am. And was there potentially cameras in the general area? Um, that uh, Mr. Kelly lived at. Yes, ma'am. But sometimes uh, these people go undetected. How come? They use tactics to avoid our camera systems and other detection devices. Okay. And so how do they do that to your personal knowledge? It, they'll follow low ground, washes, ravines, stay out of sight. So cameras don't see that lower ground as well as if they're above the ravine? Yes, ma'am. And the terrain is covered with these ravines, creating you know, almost like an anthill of pathways through this area, correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, now, there's uh, something also that might happen out there is, well, let me, let me strike that. Let me get to that in a second. Is it the people that carry the backpacks, are they usually transporting items? Yes, ma'am. Your Honor, again, objection. This calls for an opinion, um, and that's this witness is listed as a as a lay witness, not as an expert witness. Objection is overruled. Go ahead, sir. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, what would you might find in a backpack with people that are 
coming in illegally, not at the checkpoints? Typically food, clothing, personal belongings, identification uh, IDs, but mainly food, clothing. What about drugs? Drugs, yes ma'am. What about guns? Yes ma'am. Is a person carrying illegal activities more likely to have a gun than someone that's not illegal? Illegally committing a, a crime like carrying something illegal? Objection form of the question? Sustained. Let me rephrase that. If a, someone is traveling with illegal drugs in their backpack, would they be the one that would be more likely armed? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, and I'm not talking about the immigrant family that's trying to find the American dream, okay? I'm talking about smugglers at this time. So you're following me, sir? Okay. Okay. Yes, ma'am. There's also a word out there called rip crews. What is that? They're bandits that kind of operate um, to either rob migrants that have crossed the border or also steal the narcotics that are coming from rival cartels. Okay. So not only are they out there trying to get to whatever destination for whatever profitability they're looking for, but they also have to face the potential of someone stealing from them. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And so knowing that as a possible environment, would that also be a reason why someone carrying a legal activity of some sort would want to be armed? Yes, ma'am. To protect themselves against other thieves? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, when people cross the border, isn't it true that it, they have to pay a price to get across? They do, yes, ma'am. Okay. And what is your knowledge about that? I've recently heard in the past year it suffers the... Again, Your Honor, objection calls for um, speculation and hearsay. Objections overruled. You can answer. You can answer. Go ahead, sir. Through what we've gathered, it's it suffered to... Eight to ten thousand dollars, depending on what country you're from, across the board. Eight to ten thousand dollars is a lot of money. Would you not agree? Yes, ma'am. And that would be dollars, not in uh, Mexican money. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so wouldn't be fun to just go over there for nothing for that much money, right? I mean, you better have a good reason to pay that kind of rough money. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, ma'am. And let's talk about drugs, for example. That's a very profitable business. <laughs> So it, it needs to be more profitable than eight to ten thousand to do it. Wouldn't that be fair to assess? That the drugs are more profitable? I'm well, gonna... if someone is going to smuggle, you would hope that they are a business person to know that they're going to make more money than eight to ten thousand if that's the fee they have to pay to get across in the first place. Wouldn't that be common sense? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, now, when you deal with pills like fentanyl, I mean, they are a pill form, correct? You see them? I have, yes, ma'am. Okay. And so you can carry a large volume of fentanyl in a, in a you know, smaller area, right? Yes, ma'am. And are you aware that fentanyl per unit is very expensive on the streets? Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too sure. Okay. The that's fine. Just testify to what you know, sir. Okay. Uh, but eventually these drugs... Uh, whatever form, whatever type, uh, could it be meth? Certainly, yes ma'am. Cocaine? Yes ma'am. And marijuana? Yes ma'am. Okay. Uh, marijuana would take up more volume in a backpack, correct? Yes ma'am. To get the larger amount for profitability, but pills are smaller, or powder would be smaller and still come back with a high volume of profitability, wouldn't you agree? Yes ma'am. Okay. So now they're out there. Do you also know that there are people that look out for the groups that are coming through illegally? Yes, ma'am. What do they call them? Scouts. Scouts. Okay. And what? Uh, let's talk about clothing and things that you would suspect would be dealing with this type of environment. Okay. Again, I'm not referencing anyone crossing an immigrant for the American dream. I'm talking about people that are conducting illegal activity. So would it be fair that lately the big the, the clothing attire that's common would be camouflage outfits? Um, so everyone that's legally crossing without inspection that's not giving up to the United States Port Patrol or between narcotics smugglers and the everyday migrant, they're all wearing camouflage. 
Everybody is. Everyone. The ones that are going to the checkpoint are? The ones that are, well, they're usually hiding in the vehicle. Okay. <clears throat> All right. And so what about binoculars? Is that a common attire for someone just looking for the American dream? Or is that someone that might be a scout that's trying to get through the uh, border illegally? So typically the scout wears the binoculars for both narcotics and human smuggling. Okay. And what about the walkie-talkie? Again, the same, they use the walkie-talkies. The scouts typically use them for smuggling humans as well as narcotics. Okay. And, um, of course, backpacks would be part of transporting something, correct? Yes, ma'am. And if it's drugs, then the drugs could fit in there, right? Yes, ma'am. Have you ever seen the fanny packs before? Yes, ma'am. And what's the purpose of the fanny pack? Typically, they're used for um, being that when, whether it's narcotic smugglers or human smugglers, um, with the migrants crossing, typically carrying a heavy load of food and clothing kind of slows you down. So when we um, intercept these people, they'll typically run from us. Um, so to ditch the weight, they'll drop the backpacks, but to maintain their personal belongings like IDs, passports, money, they'll keep in a fanny pack that way. They can still run quickly without that heavy backpack of the food. They just keep the personal belongings on them. Let's talk about the money. Everyone wants to protect their money first, right? Yes, ma'am. And so clothes won't matter if you have to run, correct? Yes, ma'am. But money might matter to that person not to lose that money, correct? Yes, ma'am. So it would not surprise you to know that if a person has a backpack, uh, excuse me, a fanny pack close to their chest, they could be carrying money in it, correct? Section form of the question. Correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, also, if there is a smaller quantity of drugs, like say, you know, a bag of cocaine or a full bag of some sort of pills, that could also be protected in the fanny pack, correct? Yes, ma'am. Contacts, introduction, and follow-up uh, communication with Alan Kelly, correct? Yes, ma'am. And he's always been very, very um, cooperative in assisting with information to you, hasn't he? Yes, ma'am. Very friendly to you? Yes, ma'am. He's a talker, isn't he? Yes, ma'am. He rambles, doesn't he? Yes, ma'am. I mean, he's a storyteller. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And, but, you know, it gets lonely out there on a ranch all day long by yourself. And so he probably welcomed the communication with you. Would you say that could be true? True, yes, ma'am. Okay. But anytime he saw anything during the time, or at least a lot of times, he texted you and said, I see a bob wire cut on my property, correct? Objection, Your Honor. This is the subject of a previous motion. Communications with the defendant. Um, let's take our afternoon recess. It's about that time anyway. I'll deal with this issue under the presence of the jurors. We're going to take a 30 minute recess. We'll come back about 10 after the I'll stay here. <coughs> Record show the, the absence of the two. All right, let's see.
Your Honor, um, counsel is about to relay communications between the defendant and this witness. Um, they're offering the defendant's statements regarding events, and the court has specifically precluded um, any of the defendant's statements that aren't offered by the state because they're self-serving hearsay. And so I'd ask that the that this line of questioning not be allowed. And Judge, they're not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted in the statements. We're talking about communication that has been ongoing between Mr. Kelly and the ranch liaison. It goes towards Mr. Kelly's state of mind, and it just goes towards the general character of the communication in between Mr. Kelly and the ranch liaison. The ranch liaison is sending text messages to him telling him to be careful, to look out for certain things. Mr. Kelly is sharing information with the ranch liaison. This is all leading up to the incident. It's illustrative of Mr. Kelly's state of mind, and the state opened the door when they entered into areas involving communication between Agent Marcel and Mr. Kelly, which they did. And in fairness, we need to be able to talk about other communication that's happened between Agent Kelly, or <laughs> Agent Marcel and Mr. Kelly. The objection was made after the first question, so we really didn't get into the questioning at all. But Ms. Lothar, where do you intend to go with this, and how far? Can I have a question word back to me? Sure. And I'm talking, how far do you intend to go with this line of questioning also? Are you going to have it read back, let's get it. Something about cutting fences. And you said, but at any time, as he saw anything during that time, or at least a lot of times, he would text you and say, I see some barbed wire cut on my property. Well, first of all, Your Honor, uh, this was already asked of this witness that they do it, and there is communication to make sure that none of them have cut the wires, but this is an ongoing relationship. I'm not trying to get into personal. I'm just leading up to the events of what happened on January 30th, the communication, so I can show the state of mind, but I'm also showing the cooperation that he was calling someone that was there to protect him and the environment that he lived in. And I'm just trying to establish that, but I'm not digging really deep, just on the surface of that to uh, inform the jurors. Well, how deep are you intending to go with your questioning into specific statements that Mr. Kelly would have made allegedly to Agent Marcel about what was happening? Well, actually, I would like permission from the court to go into the questions that proceed January 30th uh, warning him of the things that he saw or my client, but they would be literally short period of time prior to January 30th. Because this is what has put him on alert for these items. He's also the one that's educated him about the types of people that are coming through the, his property and around his property. And that's where he's learned it. They brought up the fact that he called them you know, different names <coughs> Um, and those names came from this person as far as educating him on the environment. I'm going to reserve ruling on a question-by-question -question basis. I have to hear the questions to know what kind of information is being elicited. The state is correct. I mean, the general rule is that uh, these statements by a party opponent when offered by the party um, of, the, of, the, of the, when offered by the party on behalf of the party is, is hearsay. So, but, um, I have to hear the questions and spe specific questions on what's directed. What are you directing the witness to in the questions? And the court, the state did specifically object to this question. The, the and just for the record, the state has only elicited testimony specifically with respect to this incident, the day of this incident. We did not elicit any testimony about any other statements. And I, I think there's sort of a rule of completeness argument being made from the other side, but. We didn't go into anything except the statements from the day of the incident, and so that would not apply. Um, and so the state is objecting to the prior com the, to the question that was asked by the defense. That's asking about cuts to the fence and things of that nature. Those are specifically statements by Mr. Kelly that this, that the state is requesting to preclude, and that was the subject of a pretrial motion. Your Honor, I will withdraw that question and only address the things that he said to, to my client. All right. Then we're in recess for 20 minutes.
all the jurors. <coughs> my last one, we've had a break, okay? Yes, okay. I'm going to reference some communication you had with my client in the month of January leading up to January 30th events, okay? Yes, ma'am. And um, back on January 13th, um, you told my client that you would pass it along, that there's been a couple of groups out there in the evening this week to the west of you. Remember that? Yes, ma'am. And you let them know through abbreviation it was closer to Buena Vista, but angling your way, correct? Yes, ma'am. So why would you tell uh, Alan this? For safety concerns, if he was out there working uh, on his property and he saw agents kind of responding in the area, he wouldn't have to give me a call wondering why agents were on his property. It's kind of just a heads up to, you know, if he's out there, no surprises. And if it gets close to his property, he should seek cover or safety, correct? Yeah, or call us. Um, if he does see them, give us a better line of travel for the group if he sees them. And you told him there was a group of, t same day. You told them there was a group of 23, 23 and a group of six, correct? Yes, ma'am. And you also told them some may have had narcotics, just a heads up. That was you, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And after communication back, you told them that you would check to see what was going on, correct? Yes, ma'am. Now, let's move to January 16th, and you let Alan know that you wanted to give him, give him a heads up, agents are working a group of 12 to your east near the Tortilla Well, just in case they come west towards your place. Yes, ma'am. So in your opinion, it was close enough to know that the movement could go that way. It was enough to tell them, correct? Yes, yes ma'am. <clears throat> On January 18th, <clears throat> you also told Alan, sir, there's another group of approximately eight agents will be working east of you near our cam camera tower. They may turn west towards you, FYI, just FYI. Correct? Yes, ma'am. And you told them after that, immediately after that, you said since the blimp went down, traffic has increased out there. Yes, ma'am. Can you explain what the blimp is? It was the, uh, the aerostat. I don't know if you guys saw it. It's the, it was the large blimp that had cameras on the bottom overlooking the Nogales. Okay, and so that was used for surveillance? Surveillance, yes ma'am. And now it wasn't there anymore? How come? Funding. It was defunded to that pool. Okay. So once it was defunded and the blimp was there, you, you made a note that it has allowed or increased more activity since then? Yes ma'am. Now on January 25th, as we're getting closer to this date, you said, sir, looks like they were working a group of 10 that entered at the end of the bollard fence. The group moved north following the fence line that's just east of your place. Do you remember saying that? Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, I'm assuming this abbreviation, H-E-L-I-O, is that abbreviation for helicopter? Yes, ma'am. Was out so long because they had, had a team on board looking to 
drop them to apprehend the group. Group was never located, though, and still outstanding. Yes, ma'am. It's hard to track these guys, aren't they? It is, yes, ma'am. I mean, they scurry pretty quick. Is that right? We do a pretty good job, but uh, yeah, it's difficult, yes, ma'am. And the uh, response time that if you were to hear a message from a rancher meeting uh, who's reporting activity, sometimes can take a little while, correct? Depending on where agents are, it could, it could just depend on where they're responding from. Okay, so where they're responding from and if they're tied up on other calls, correct? Yes, ma'am. I would assume that you are not overstaffed by any means. Is that a fair assessment? It's very fair, yes, ma'am. Okay. And so you're working hard and long, and it's hard to get to every location quick enough to possibly catch some of these people that are coming across illegally, correct? Yes, ma'am. On January 27th, you said, just received your text for some reason. How many cuts did you have? So you have responded to information about cuts in the fence line, right? Yes, ma'am. And you did want to know if it was your guys or was it illegals because if it was your team, you would want to make sure it gets repaired. It, it, either side, if it's them or us, to have it repaired, but mainly if it's our guys, that way I can address it with the, the agents that are cutting the fence and not repairing it timely, but both. And after communication, you told him yeah, there has been narcotic trafficking picking up around Keno, and that's Keno Springs, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now that was, by the way, January 27th through January 28th. That's just before the events that happened that brings us to court here today, correct? Yes, ma'am. So, You can imagine the mindset of a senior citizen couple out there knowing that there's lots of activity all around them, right? Yes, ma'am. And you could understand the stress that it would cause a rancher out there um, anticipating whether or not they could or may be in danger, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I mean, you're trained to handle it, right? Certainly, yes, ma'am. And not knowing his background, but definitely considering his age, that's a factor um, for any couple to consider, will I be okay on my property? Yes, ma'am. So let's get into a little bit of January 30th then. Now, you, we got the chart still up there that was used for demonstrative purposes. Let's talk a little bit about that and some of the things that you wrote in your report. Uh, but isn't it true, not only did you write a report, but you were inter interviewed by Detective Einza, correct? Yes, ma'am. And would that be the gentleman at the other table? What happened to I'm not sure. I can put it back up. Yes, Thank you. Thank you for that. Sure. Detective Einza is at the opposite table to my right at the very end to the right, correct? Yes, ma'am. That's the man that interviewed you? Yes, ma'am. Did it feel like you were being interrogated? No, ma'am. No? Okay. So when you talked to him, did you have a report or a memorandum yet created? Yes, ma'am. So you had that before you talked to the detective? Yes, ma'am. Did you bring it with you or provide it later? I don't recall. Okay. And you would agree that when something happens, it's a good idea to make notes of it as soon as possible because your mind is fresh with information. Yes, ma'am. But you were off. Yes, ma'am. So um, you were at the gym on one of the calls, correct? Yes, ma'am. You were checking out on another call, correct? Yes, ma'am. You were with your family on a call, weren't you? Yes, ma'am. So when did you get this report created? Approximately, I started at 0600 the following day. Okay. 
January 31st. Okay, so you had a chance to sleep and then come back into work and do your routine, and then you sat down and made this report. Yes, ma'am. And then, do you know when you gave him the report, the detective? No, ma'am. Okay. Do you know when you were interviewed by the detective? I don't know the exact date. <clears throat> if you were to estimate, was it a few days later, a week later, two weeks, what would you guess? A few days. A few days later? Yes, ma'am. Were you being interviewed in the interview room at the sheriff's uh, department? I, I believe so, yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, the first thing we see on this uh, illustration here at 2.30 is I'm being shot at and I'm shooting back. Is it very clear that there is a gun out there? Isn't that statement clearly telling you there is some form of a weapon out there that's shooting at him? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So there's no question in mind that there's at least at least one, if not more, guns, correct? Yes, ma'am. And it's very clear also that when he states, I'm shooting back, as illustrated on this, um, <coughs> at 2.30 on this chart, that he is shooting at someone back, right? Yes, ma'am. And when you shoot back at something, it means you've already been shot at, usually, correct? Yes, ma'am. And isn't that possibly considered self-defense? Yes, ma'am. Okay? You know enough to know what self-defense is, right? Yes, ma'am. You do have a right as an officer to apply self-defense for your own safety, too, don't you? Yes, ma'am. Your Honor, objection. Call for a legal conclusion. I'll, I'll, I'll <clears throat> So I know we were questioning your knowledge of state law versus federal, and I just wanted to make sure that you understand self-defense. Okay, thank you. And you describe this demeanor that he had at that time was what? When he when you got the first call? Rushed, kind of frantic. Now you can't see him, right? No, ma'am. You have no idea where he's standing. No, ma'am. Okay. You have no idea what he's seeing at that moment. No, ma'am. And, but definitely in some form of stress. Yes, ma'am. Now, if someone's pointing a gun at you, you might want to be rushed in defending yourself, right? Yes, ma'am. And in this rush, um, in this rushed moment of com communicating, that's when you started hearing I'm being shot at. Yes, ma'am. Now, did you have reason to believe that the defendant was at home and his wife was at home also? Civilian. Did you have knowledge based on the calls? that not only was Alan at home, but Wanda, his wife, was at home. L later in the, after um, you know, the, the other phone calls, then yes, he stated his wife was there. Okay, so you did learn that. <coughs> yes, ma'am. And as a male, as a person of care, a husband um, would not be surprised that one would want to protect his family member or his wife as well, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you would want to do the same, wouldn't you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, now, if, when you first learned, there were five subjects with packs running southbound. So, do you know which direction that is in relationship to the house? Are you familiar with the directionality of the home to the property? Yes, ma'am. Is it possible that what was observed <coughs> was running across the view of, from inside the house through the windows to the right, from left to right. Would that be southbound? From from my understanding of this home, I don't really know exactly what his house looks like, but from my understanding from the house, southbound would be towards the fence, towards the international boundary. Like, I don't know what his, his windows face. Okay, so do you not know that the the boundary, the international boundary, would be eastbound from the backyard of his house? That the international boundary would be eastbound yeah, from the, the back. Wall. 
the wall. From the backyard of his house? Yes. I'm not, so I guess I don't understand where his backyard is. So if the window he was looking at was facing east, then southbound would be to his right. Yes, ma'am. Okay, just let's go with direction. Yeah. So, and again, I, in all fairness, you weren't there that moment, correct? Correct, yes, But you have been to the home. Yes, ma'am. You have been shown around the home. Not around the actual house itself, immediate, but from the home to the barn, yes, ma'am. Okay. So, the you are claiming that you learned from Alan that these subjects, five subjects, were running southbound, and that's where we get that information, correct? Yes, ma'am, that's what he said. Okay. Um, and then, and this is 2.30, and you, did you feel like he had to address the issue at hand? Was he asking for help? He was stating a problem. I mean, he called me for a reason, so I assumed, yes, he wanted help. Okay. Well, if someone calls law enforcement and says, I'm being shot at, are they counting on your help? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And did you know that you provided a business card of you as a liaison to this family for them to be able to call you at any time? I believe I did. And that would be your business cell phone line? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And did you later learn the number that she referenced, the, the idea, the, the prosecutor referenced was um, Wanda's phone? I later found that out, yes, ma'am. Okay. But you didn't recognize it first, but you did take the call? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Because it was a duty phone? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, did you get off and then go back on the phone with him at 2.36? Yes, ma'am. Have you called your station at this time and or communicated with them that uh, there was a problem on the uh, Vermilion Ranch? Yes, ma'am. Now, you wrote in here, well, it's being reflected that you're stating there was an altercation. That's pretty much a law enforcement word, isn't it? That wasn't his exact word, was it? No, no, ma'am. Okay. No, ma you're paraphrasing. Yes, ma'am. Because altercation is very law enforcement, correct? There's an altercation somewhere. That's something you would write in a report, wouldn't it be? Yes, ma'am. Okay. But somehow there was a, some sort of connection with a subject running towards Keno Springs. That's what, what is reflected on this demonstrative <coughs> illustration, correct? Yes, ma'am. Now, we already know that he saw something, that there was a gun, there was a shot, and that he might have to defend himself, right? So, Section compound gun. Is it? I'll fix it. Oh, thank you. Is it possible at this point in time, due to the stress that he's under, there is a lot of stress, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And <clears throat> even though you said he may have been a little bit calmer, there was still a lot of adrenaline was your words. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And that adrenaline is coming from danger or something that's causing you to rise to that level, right? Objection calls for speculation, Yes, ma'am. Okay. And that's a word you used a couple times, isn't it? In your description. To be clear, adrenaline? Yes. Yes, ma'am. You testified a couple times using that word. Yes, ma'am. And when a person is under adrenaline, they are under anxiety, they're hyped up, their body is reacting to some form of danger, correct? Yes, ma'am. No doubt in your mind, I would assume, that there wasn't danger in front of them. It's very believable, wasn't it? Yes, ma'am. You don't think Same. he made this up, do you? Same objection, Your Honor. Do you think he made it up? From your perception at the time, was it real? 
I wasn't there to determine whether they made it up. I just wanted to make sure he was safe at the time. So me wondering if it was made up or I didn't care if it was real or fake. Somebody's reporting to me in a professional setting. I wanted the agents out there to, to, to figure out what was going on. At, based on the tone and his reaction, did it appear to be real? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Now, you also learned that there was a horse running by and was, you know, acting out, was upset, was was bucking or doing what it did. What did you learn about the horse? It was running by his home frantically. Okay, frantically. And a horse wouldn't make that up, would it? A horse would be reacting to something that might be real. Correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <clears throat> Now, what you may or may not know was, and I don't know if you learned later or not, but there was, once the issue was addressed with the five running by, <coughs> there was more people out east of his house. Yes, Your Honor. Is it possible? That's not in evidence. Stay. Well, if you can rephrase the question. <coughs> is it the question, possible? The question is asked. The, the, uh, is it possible under the stress of the moment that there was more activities going on than what you are hearing? Yes. Is it possible, based on you not getting a visual on what he's seeing, that you don't have a good reading on what he's trying to tell you? Is that possible? Yes. So. The fact that subjects went from 10 and then 10 to 15 um, could be your lack of interpreting what he's seeing, correct? Because you can't see what he's seeing. Yes. But I would like to know in your report, you only said 10. You never said 15. Where did that change? Just re reflecting on the situation. Um, Pretty bad, and put in the report, but pretty positive. He said 10 to 50, gave an approximate group size later. <clears throat> well, but, but you know how important a report is, right? Yes, ma'am. And it's important that you put all details in there so it can be utilized properly for investigation and then possibly courtrooms, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And is it fair to say you never noted 15 in your report? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. And was it also noted in any of the communications that his wife, Wanda, saw these five people or some of or whatever running by with backpacks and guns and rifles? It was noted in our report. Okay. So now you have not only the Allen as a witness to what he's observing through the call, but substantiating that his wife saw it and his horse might have reacted to the same thing, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Sure makes the situation a little more real that there's uh, three different sources of information that might support this a shooting going on. Yes, right? ma'am. Thank you. Um, <coughs> now, when you had the call and he thanks you. What time was that? 4.23. Okay. Now, he's still a little <coughs> bit excited, but a little bit calm. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And he's thanking you for your help, isn't he? Yes, ma'am. He's thanking you for getting law enforcement to his property to help him, aren't you? Isn't he? Yes, ma'am. Does that sound to you like a guilty person? No, no. I mean, he's thanking you for helping him. Correct? That's yes. That's monster speculation. Yes. Yes. Now, at this point in time, there is no sign of a body, right? We're at no. 423. No, ma'am. Matter of fact, do you learn, you know, because you asked to be updated, right? Yes, ma'am. You care about what happens to this man next to me, correct? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And you learn that law enforcement does come out to the scene, right? Yes, ma'am. 
And they searched the premises around. Are you aware of that? Yes, ma'am. And nothing was found. Correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes, okay. And did you learn that he was cooperative with everybody? Yes, ma'am. Did you learn that he went to his barn and checked on his horse and making sure the premises was still safe um, after this event? I, I, never, I never heard. Did you hear that they had to find him when they got to the location? Law enforcement had to look for him a little bit. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So you didn't know he came from his barn no, back to the house? Okay. No, ma'am. That's fine. And his wife also was talked to. Were you aware of that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so everyone told you, or told everyone there, the law enforcement that responded, which is Border Patrol and Sheriff's, correct? I should go back. I didn't know she was spoken to that day, if that's what you meant. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Yes. We just want you to tell what you do now. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> but Border Patrol and Sheriff's responded, correct? Yes, ma'am. And as a team, they appeared to be working together, checked out the, the facility, the property, nothing was determined, and they left. Correct? Foundation. And they left, correct? Yes, ma'am. From your knowledge of what you inquired? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Again, you still haven't been out to this location. No, ma'am. And you actually haven't been out there at all since this date, right? No, ma'am. Okay. Uh, Alan informed you at 423 he thought they were drug mules. Did he tell you why he thought so? They were carrying large packs. And would it surprise you that a lot of his information about what was going on might have came through you and any other previous ranch liaison? Yes, ma'am. So, and so when he responded to say that's why he thought that, it's not like he could look in the bags, right? No, ma'am. Okay. But since the description fit the bill of what he's learned and what drug traffickers do, uh, it was a reasonable conclusion. Would you agree? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Did, uh, did you inquire into any surveillance yourself to see if anyone spotted anyone? No, ma'am. Okay. But you're not surprised that whoever was there left and couldn't be found happens all the time, right? As in the subjects? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so um, they get down in those ravines and it's hard to track, correct? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And then at 523, 526, you have a, an array of missed calls but ultimately, you testified you connected with Alan, correct? Yes, ma'am. And this time, he's even more frantic than before. Would that be fair to say? <coughs> as far as his behavior, his voice? I wouldn't say frantic, more just scared. Um, if they're the same, I mean. Could shock? be part of that? Yes, ma'am. Now, ultimately, we know there was a body found. But people don't find bodies every day, do they? No, ma'am. People don't have law enforcement at the house earlier report shots fired, and then there's a body, right? Yes, ma'am. Have you ever noticed that my client has a big tractor hoe that can dig big holes and put bodies in it? Have you seen that tractor on no, his property? I don't recall. Yet there's a body found in a field, a couple barbed wires fenced down <coughs> that law enforcement later get called to and he shows them where they are, correct? Yes, ma'am. Now, do you know where he was when he called you? No, ma'am. Do you know that he might be standing next to the body? No, ma'am. You don't know. If he was out there, is it possible he didn't know who was around him? Yes, ma'am. 
And that would be a reason to be very evasive and scared, not knowing if he was going to be killed next. Correct? Yes, ma'am. I mean, there's a danger out there when you're out in a field with a dead body already, and you don't know who's watching you, right? Yes, ma'am. And this Your instruction is, calls for facts, not the evidence. This terrain is very well heavily um, condensed with trees and cactuses and tall grass and I mean it's not an empty field correct no matter so and then there's the ravines correct correct yes ma'am and there is a ravine in this direction that if someone was hiding in there they could very well be watching him correct yes ma'am or behind the shrubs and bushes and things that's there someone could be out there yes ma'am wouldn't that be a pretty good reason to be a little bit evasive? Yes, ma'am. If he was out there. So, he, you tell him, is this an animal? You started that conversation, if I heard you right earlier. Correct? Yes, ma'am. And so there's this communication of, yes, it's like an animal of some sort, right? Rather than a mineral or a vegetable, it was an animal. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and you're just trying to get him to talk to you in some way that you can try to understand the nature of the seriousness of what's going on. Yes, ma'am. You had an idea something was definitely not good. Exactly, yes, ma'am. And you now had an idea that maybe there was a body out there, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you just was trying your best to work with him to gather as much information as possible so you could help report it. Yes, ma'am. And that's what law enforcement does. Yes, ma'am. But whatever reason, he was scared to just say, I see a dead man out here, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. But he wanted help, right? Yes. He left messages, call me immediately, correct? Yes, ma'am. He left a voice message and a text message, correct? Yes, ma'am. Asking for help, trying to get you on the phone, correct? Yes, ma'am. He trusted you, didn't he? Yes. And he really wanted you out there, didn't he? Yes. But you were off, and you have a right to be off, correct? Yes, ma'am. So the next best thing was just to get whatever you can in the way of heaven, correct? Yes, ma'am. And there really wasn't anyone aboard a patrol that was available at the time, right? No, there wasn't. Okay, so the next best thing was to get a hold of supervisors that ultimately got a hold of the sheriff's department, correct? Yes, ma'am. Trust goes a long way, doesn't it? Yes, ma'am. And this was a very scary situation. Would you agree it would have been if you saw that? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So then 535, he's hinting, it is worse than he could ever imagine. This is bad. He's giving you hints that there's a problem out there, correct? Yes, ma'am. There's urgency to this, correct? Yes, ma'am. Please send someone to his house. Is that a person asking for help? Yes, ma'am. And we see on here that you were trying to get the information, but his evasiveness is not necessarily a negative thing. It could be for more than one reason, as you just testified to, correct? Yes, ma'am. And then, who knows what he meant by asked if this was being reported. We don't know what it meant, do you? It was weird, but you don't know what he meant by that, do you? I assume he meant, is it going to be reported to law enforcement? Like a, well, you are for, law enforcement. Well, I mean, further up my chain of command, I assumed. Okay. But he's asking for help, so maybe he wants it. <coughs> right? You don't know, do you? No. Okay. So in his way, under stress, that could be him saying, get someone out here, right? Could be, yeah. Yes, sir. Then he says, you know how shots were fired earlier? He's referencing your earlier phone call, correct? Yes, ma'am. And your words were something was possibly struck. Is that verbatim? Is Did that, you say my words? That wasn't that, my words. Those were his? Oh, that were his words. He said something was possibly struck. 
But you never told anyone in when you reported this that he admitted to striking someone, did you? These yes. are the words you reported. That's exactly what I reported to my supervisor that he had called me stating that something was possibly struck, so he wouldn't tell me exactly what it was, so you should send the agents out there. That Mr. Kelly stated something was possibly struck is what I told my supervisor. Right. And did you later learn that those words got twisted from what you said? No. You don't know that? No. Okay. But these are your words, right? That you are reflecting from him. Yes, ma'am. And this is what you wrote in your report. Yes, ma'am. And this is what you told your supervisor. Yes, ma'am. And this is what you told the detective in the interview. Yes, ma'am. And if anything got changed from this, you don't know anything about it? No, ma'am. Because that didn't happen. That's not what you said. This is what you said was up on the board, right? Yes, ma'am. He never said, I shot or killed someone, did he? No, ma'am. Said he might have to in self-defense earlier, but at this point in time, he didn't say, I shot and killed someone. Correct? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. So if something was possibly struck versus your earlier testimony, something may have been struck earlier, Is do you know which way it came out? In my report, I believe I said something was possibly struck earlier. Earlier. <coughs> earlier. Yes. Okay. So earlier in your mind was possibly when you got the first call. The 2.30 phone call, yes ma'am. Now, you don't know, based on what he saw when they said, don't know if all, if, if they had guns. Let's see, what was that? Ten subjects with, and I'm back at 423 on this illustration here. Ten subjects with packs, all with AKs. Versus, don't know if all had guns or AKs. Is that possible that if you didn't hear a word that it could have been miscommunicated? So just to be clear, he stated that they had AR style rifles, not AKs. Okay. And also he said it was too far to tell if they had firearms at 236, if that's what you're referenc referencing. Yeah, but it says uh, we have packs are, so it's not AKs, it's ARs. AR style rifles. Okay, so at 423, that's not accurate on here? It should say AR style rifles. Okay, that's fine. And. So when discussing whether or not they had these AORs, uh, is it possible that he said it was too far to know if they all had AORs? So the only discussion, I think you're mixing up two conversations here. Okay. At the 423, I didn't ask anything about firearms in my conversation with him. He had stated 10 subjects with AR style rifles. But at 2.36, for clarification purpose, for reporting to the agents responding, I asked him if he saw any firearms, and he had stated it was too far to tell. Okay, because the word they all had firearms been part of his communication. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma and I apologize for getting those two things. This I didn't create this chart. <laughs> so, okay. It's under stress, under the excitement of a phone, and you trying to listen as you're 
walking out of the station or whatever what you were doing. Um, it, I mean, it's communication's not one hundred percent perfect, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <clears throat> now we talked about um, Alan carrying a handgun, and you were aware of that from the very beginning in this holster, correct? Yes, ma'am. And is it unusual for a rancher to not want to carry a handgun? I mean, there's rattlesnakes out there, isn't there? Yes, ma'am. There's wild um, coyotes and things out there, correct? Yes, ma'am. And what if one of them tried to ta attack their pets? Wouldn't a farmer rancher want to protect that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so carrying a handgun is a good safety measure on a you know, open range ranch like that, correct? Yes, ma'am. Then there's the other issues, of course. And later you learned from him that he started carrying his long rifle, correct? Yes, ma'am. But that goes with all the information that there's a lot of activity out there, right? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Now, with technology nowadays, more and more agencies are given body cams and recording devices when talking to someone. In this case, there was no recording, right? Not that I'm aware of. Other than the voice message that we heard, correct? Yes, ma'am. So, this communication back and forth is your interpretation um, of what you think you heard, correct? Yes, ma'am. And you don't have a recording device to go back and verify exactly the word choice that was used? No, ma'am. And then you would agree that word choice can be very important to change a meaning, correct? Yes, ma'am. Pass the witness. Be direct. Thank you, Eric. <coughs> Agent Porcelli, I want to start with that statement at 236 um, that we're talking about. Let's let's talk first generally. While these events were happening, what what were you doing to document the phone calls? Anything? It wasn't until later, I believe, um, when they discovered the uh, deceased individuals when I started taking down notes. So you were taking down notes from what happened earlier in the earlier day? Earlier in the day, yes, ma'am. So that was that evening you took down notes? Yes, ma'am. And when you got the call at 2.30, the first call at 2.30, did you immediately go and talk to Agent Tercy? Via the telephone, yes ma'am, immediately. And would that information have gotten relayed um, through Agent Tercy? Yes ma'am. So that information would have been documented through Border Patrol at that time, in real time, correct? Yes ma'am. Um, same thing with the 2.36 phone conversation, correct? Yes ma'am. Um, same thing with the 535 phone conversation, correct? Yes, ma'am. You probably didn't call anyone at 423 because there wasn't anything new to report at that time. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And defense counsel asked you about your conversation, your interview with Detective Ainsa, but that wasn't the first time you talked to Detective Ainsa, was it? No, ma'am. When was the first time you talked to Detective Ainsa? I believe it was that evening pretty late at like 2200 hours. So you talked to Detective Ainsa and you told him about those conversations at some point on January 30th, is that right? Yes ma'am. And you said 2200, are you certain about the time or is that a guess? That's an approximation. Okay, and so, but you did relay all those details to Detective Ainsa on January 30th? Yes ma'am. So let's talk about the 236 phone conversation. Now, um, Ms. Lothorpe wants you to specu speculate about whether you missed a word in the too far to tell if they had firearms. She wants you to speculate if he said too, tar too far to tell if they all had firearms. Um, is the firearm issue an important <coughs> officer safety issue for your responding officers? Yes, ma'am. 
do you think you would have taken care to make sure you knew whether he said they were too far to tell if they had firearms versus they were too top far to tell if they all had firearms? Yes, ma'am. Is that a mistake you would have made? No, ma'am. Council asked you about part of the statement um, on the 535 call, something was possibly struck. Now, I know you wrote one statement in your report and you gave us a slightly different statement during your interview. So I'm not sure which is accurate, but I wanna make sure we have it in context. During your interview, you told us, you know how shots were fired earlier, something was possibly struck. Is that what Mr. Kelly said to you or did he say something else? That would have been the most accurate statement earlier <clears throat> so you know how shots were fired earlier something was possibly struck yes sir and that's referring to when he said he was he was fired upon and he was returning fire yes sir and by that I mean he said I'm being shot at and I'm shooting back yes sir Now, Ms. Lothorpe also wants you to speculate about what was happening around Mr. Kelly as he was talking to you um, and whether he was under, whether the nervousness and the, and the scared um, tone you heard in his behavior had something to do with what was going on around him. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. And whether when he asked if it was being reported, if that had something to do with that. Is that what she asked you? Yes, ma'am. When, when you were talking to Mr. Kelly and he asked you, is this being reported? Was that in conjunction with him asking um, if you were gonna send the Sheriff's Department out at the same time? Yes, ma'am. And so those two things together, what did you think he meant when he said to you, when he asked if this was being reported? So when should talk to for speculation, oh. what he meant? Oh. It's responsive to the question. Do you want me to ask that again? Yeah, yes, ma'am. What did you think Mr. Kelly meant when he asked you if this was being reported? My initial thought was, um, how to phrase it, if this can be like brushed under the rug, like not reported to the, who may arrest him for something. And was that the implication you got from his tone and the, and the way the conversation was going? Yes, ma'am and surrounding with the details about him not wanting the Sheriff's Department to respond? Yes, ma'am. And Ms. Lothorpe asked you if Mr. Kelly wanted help. Um, he did want help from Border Patrol, correct? Yes, ma'am. And if I understood your, converse, your statements, you indicated he was reluctant for the Sheriff's Department to respond. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. So he wanted help from you, but not from the Sheriff's Department? Yes, ma'am. Now, Ms. Lothar, in discussing this issue about whether Mr. Kelly was concerned while he was calling you, on that last phone call. Do you know where he was at that time? No, ma'am. Could have been in his house, could have been out of his house. You don't know, is that right? Yes, ma'am, I don't know. But you did know that Border Patrol had just been out there and so had the Sheriff's Department just a couple of hours before, correct? Yes, ma'am. And you knew that they did a security sweep when they were out there, correct? Yes, ma'am. And can you talk to me about the difference between if you're searching a property versus if you're just doing a security sweep? So if you're just doing a security sweep opposed to, uh, can you say that again? Sure. Like if you're doing an actual search of a property, like you're looking for something specific versus a security sweep to see if there's any danger. So for the searching for something, you're gonna actually you know, investigate, ask questions of where to look, who, when, where, why where to like a foundation to start from and then kind of branch out from that where a security sweep would, would be mainly kind of everyone moving at one line, pushing in one direction, kind of sweeping the area. Just to look if there's any threat? Yes, ma'am, for threat. 
And and you weren't there, so you don't know what they did while they were there, correct? Correct. Could have been a security sweep, could have been a search. You have no idea what they were doing. I don't know. Now, now, you know what Mr. Kelly told you that Wanda saw, but you didn't actually speak to Wanda, did you? No, ma'am. So you don't know what her statement is about what she may have seen and what she did not see, correct? Correct. So all you know is what he told you? Yes, ma'am. And Ms. Lothrop was asking you if you somehow thought that based on Mr. Kelly's tone, this incident was made up. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. I mean, clearly it wasn't made up, right? Right. Because we know there was a dead body there. Correct. Defense counsel asked you if you would um, defend yourself and your wife in this situation. Yes. Do you remember that question? I do, yes, ma'am. If you heard a shot outside, would you leave your house with an AK-47 and shoot at people you can't see in order to defend your wife who you left behind in the house unarmed and afraid? I would object to the question uh, argumented. There's facts. I'm sorry, my speaker's on. Facts not even admitted in there in this question. So, and it's calling for speculation on top. It's a state. Well, let me ask it to you this way. If you were inside your house with your wife, would you consider it to be defending yourself if you left the house to respond to a shot that was off in the distance? I mean, I'd definitely <laughs> do it the uh, safest way possible. So I'd probably remain in the home, but still take a cover and be able to still see what is out there, the threat. Would you let, leave your wife behind? No. <clears throat> now I'd like to talk to you about the January 27th and 28th conversation you had with Mr. Kelly. On that occasion, you indicated that Mr. Kelly told you he had cuts, cuts to his fence. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. So that would have just been a couple of days before this incident. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. talk about the Keno Springs area in general. Could you tell me in January of 2023, um, well first let me back up, can you tell me what a 1325 and a 1326 are? So 1325 is an unlawful entry without inspection, those crossing the border other than a border entry. Um, 1326 is a, a re-entry after you've been excluded or deported from the country prior. Can you tell me in January of 2023, um, what percentage of your arrests in the Keno Springs area were related to 1325 and 1326 or illegal entry? I 
I'd say probably for apprehend physical apprehensions, probably upwards to 98% apprehensions of 1325 and 1326 opposed to other apprehensions of narcotics. So the majority was um, 1325, 1326. So one to 2% of your apprehensions in Keno Springs in January of 2023 were drug um, apprehensions? Correct. Ms. Lothar asked you about rip crews, um, and you explained a little bit what a rip crew is. When's the last time you saw a rip crew in Keno Springs? I, I couldn't tell you the last time we've seen a rip crew in Keno Springs. More than 10 um, years? Yes, ma'am. Um, where do you see rip crews? Predominantly on the west side of Nogales, Arizona, like far west, um, the mountain ranges, out towards Arabaca. In fact, you worked on a flex crew that worked in that area, is that right? Yes, ma'am. So, rip crews, we don't see in Keno Springs, we see them west of I-10. Yeah, or west of, west of I-19. Yes, ma'am. They typically operate kind of further out, away from town. <clears throat> Let's talk about AK-47s and other AR-style rifles. When's the last time you saw an AK-47 or an AR-style rifle in the Keno Springs area? It's probably, it's been 10 plus years probably since we've physically seen them out there, or like north of the fence, north of the boundary. Through the boundary, what do you mean? Like in the United States, not in Mexico. Okay, so 10 plus years since you've seen them north of the border. Yes, ma'am. You see them across the line, is that right? Yes, ma'am. a rip crew or some kind of cartel hit, do you see a one shot from far away or do you see a different kind of scenario? No, it calls for speculation. Your Honor, this is directly in response to what counsel asked. No, typically, it's the, when we see the victims of a uh, rip crew, it's multiple gunshot wounds, multiple shell casings in the area. And do you, if there's a, a hit on someone, do you see, do cartels try to make a statement? Yes, ma'am. And what kind of things do you see when they do that? I mean, they try to take out everybody they can in that, in that, group, in that group, I guess, if, if that's what they're pursuing. Do, would you typically see one shot to the back in a cartel hit? No, so the, the recruits that we predominantly see are those, um, stealing loads from other cartels. It's usually not a, like a hit per se on a person, it's a robbery gone bad, um, whether they use your guns or not. Do we, do we see hits on cartel members from other hits in the United States? Yes, ma'am. And where do we typically see those? Cities. Um, do we see them very often? Not very often. Do those typically happen south of the border? Yes, ma'am. And if you're going to see a hit on someone, is it going to be one shot from far away? No. They're going to make a. They're going to make a mess. Right. right. She's making a statement. Yeah. I want to ask you a little bit about. Um, I think you. You covered this pretty well earlier, but we, we talked about um, backpacks. And I think I understood you to say you see the same type of clothing and backpacks for both folks who are traveling here, as the defense said, for the American dream versus um, folks who are transporting drugs. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. So you couldn't tell anything based on the clothing. Is that right? No, ma'am. And the fanny packs, does everyone carry their fanny pack in the same fashion? No, ma'am. No. 
So I think council said something about people carrying their fanny pack close to their chest. Does everybody carry it that, carry it that way? No, ma'am. What types of ways do you see people carrying their fanny pack? Depending on the conditions, sometimes the strap breaks, they have it tied around their waist. They do have it kind of strapped here. Kind of have it, have it slang like a satchel, tossed on their back, carrying it in their hand in numerous ways. So lots of different ways. Yes, ma'am. Now, council asked you about radios. Um, are there, so we talked about scouts having radios. Are there sometimes um, folks who are crossing, who are just crossing, again, for the American dream, that part of their payment is that they carry the radio and they say the pickup, they get people to the pickup location? Yes, ma'am. Is that pretty typical? It's, it's, it's more common for the scout to carry the radio, but yes, we have seen um, somebody dedicated in the group for either a discount or, you know, we, we do see a normal person in the group carrying a radio occasionally. And I used a phrase that I, I didn't ask you to explain. Could you explain to the jury what a pickup location is? It's where the, uh, the groups or the narcotics are loading into a vehicle to continue further into the United States. So they hop the fence, they're on foot, they trek north to a designated location to some sort of vehicle or house, um, but usually a pickup location is being picked up by a vehicle to be transported further north. And you said backpacks, if I understood you correctly, those could be used for drugs, or they could be used for food and clothing, etc. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. And so if you found a backpack with food and clothing in it, is that is that necessarily exclusive of drugs? No, ma'am. They keep them together in the same backpack? The drugs and the food? Right, that's what I'm asking. It, it, typically it's separate. The food's in a separate bag than the drugs. So if you've got a backpack with food and clothes, that's probably not a drug backpack. Is that what you're saying? More than likely not. Thank you, Honor. That's all I had. Are there, questions? Are there questions for this witness from the jurors?
question from the juror, and the juror creates it if this is an appropriate question, was does Mr. Kelly wear prescription glasses for nearsightedness? And if yes, was he wearing them at the time of the alleged shooting? A question mark, and does one of Mrs. Kelly? So this witness uh, was not present um, at the time of the shooting and did not meet with Mr. Kelly on that day of question, so he would be in no position to be able to answer whether or not Mr. Kelly was wearing them at the time of the alleged shooting. Um, I, it's a good question. It's a very good question. Well, I do think there are other witnesses who are likely to testify who would have more personal knowledge about, uh, about Mr. Kelly's glasses, why he wears glasses, and what he wears them for, and maybe even whether he was wearing them or not at the time he had contact with law enforcement in the question. So good question, but I'm going to hold it, hold it off in advance. I think there are people who can answer it better. Okay. I understand. Okay. Good question. I get a question from the jurors. Did I miss anybody? Are there any other questions from any of the jurors? Seeing none. Sir, you can step down. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's, um, well, let's get on here real quick. Starting at 8.30, but once we start a trial after a couple days, I usually ask the jurors whether that works for them or not. And you can start at 9 o'clock if 8.30 is too early. And you can all discuss this amongst yourselves. Let's start at 8.30 tomorrow. But if it doesn't work for you generally, you want to adjust to 9 o'clock for whatever reason, you have other responsibilities in the morning, or you live too far away or whatever, why don't you all talk amongst each other and see if you can come to some consensus about whether you want to continue starting at 8.30 or at 9. Of course, if we could start at 9, that might result in us going a little later in the afternoons than if we start at 30. You talk, you folks talk, and uh, come back tomorrow and let me know what you think. Fair enough. Any questions from the jurors about logistics, scheduling, or anything like that? <coughs> Good. All right. I'm going to stay here. You're excused. Please be in the jury room before 8:30. Goodbye, the court. Let's see, the jury's absent. What's the yeah, sure. We've got two witnesses flying in on Friday, so in case we're in the middle of a witness from Thursday, we need the permission to call them out of order because they're flying in on Friday. We just want to notify the court that there will be a break in witness testimony. Problem with that? Sure. Sure, do you have a problem with that or should you have no problem? <laughs> no, that's fine. All right, thank you. Okay, um, we'll see you after tomorrow morning. Please rise.